I'm going to get started. Um, this is a pretty dense talk, so I need every minute I can get. Um, if you go to my website, it's just my name.com. I'll have the slide deck, and if you wanted to follow along there, you can. But I'm going to, this is a pretty dense slide deck, so I'm going to go pretty quickly. Um, so following along on the web would be great. Um, here we go. Let's get started. So first, I want to tell you a little bit about myself. Um, my name is Mike Abiezzi. I'm a software consultant. I work at QuickLeft. QuickLeft is a mobile and web application company. Um, I live in Boulder. I've been here for about three years. I love it here. I'm very excited to be at Rocky Mountain Ruby with you guys presenting to you. I'm also really nervous because I know a lot of you guys, so I hope I do well. I wish myself luck. <laughs> so building a complex domain um, is a difficult thing to do. And this is the book, Domain Driven Design. This was written in 2003 by Eric Evans. And it's a pretty dense book. Um, Eric is the guy that pioneered this concept. And he, um, because he did pioneer the concept, this is the de facto book on the subject. So if you haven't read it, I highly recommend it. So how many here know what Domain Driven Design is? Good, it's about 30%. How many of you here have tried to use domain-driven design in a Rails application? Great. So probably, I'd say, 20%. This so is interesting. So we're going to be building a Rails application using domain-driven design principles. So first, let's get some basics out of the way. What's a domain? A domain can be a doctor's office, where you have doctors and patients and record keeping in between. A domain can also be a new idea, such as Twitter, which is a microblogging service with tweets, followers, and followings. A domain can be anything. Um, it can even be collecting really cute cat gifts. So the point is that um, a domain is the subject matter that you're building software around. So I'm glad Let's get, we got that out of the way. So why does DDD exist? Well, let's look at an example. Say we're building a Rails application. We have a few models. And we have a small team, two developers. And we're really productive. We're churning out feature after feature. And we feel awesome. right? That's kind of what made Rails popular in the beginning. Kind of feel like this guy. So over time, your Rails models get bigger. You have maybe 50 to 100. Your team also gets bigger, maybe it quadrupled. And you begin to slow down. Um, there's more defects than there used to be. Turning out features becomes more difficult. And a lot of us have felt this pain. Um, as a consultant, I see a lot of client applications that have gone through this where it's a big monolithic Rails app, and it's hard to um, rationalize it, and it's hard to get anything done. So we end up feeling like this turtle. So the point of domain-driven design is to address the fact that software becomes complex quickly and um, to create structure to address that. So what this talk is not about, um, there's a lot of topics on DDD, and I just want to make sure I set up expectations with everybody. It's not about a custom architecture for domain-driven design. It's not about design patterns specific to, to domain-driven design, such as repository pattern. And it's not about advanced topics, such as what a bounded context is. Right? Custom is expensive. If you're a startup, there's a reason startups like Rails, because it's fast. So we don't necessarily want to go custom right away. We might have not even proven our, our market. Um, we might just throw away the app in the end. So we got to be very conscious about when we do these custom things. They're all great, but there's a time and place for it. What we are going to talk about is taking domain driven design principles and applying it to a Rails application. And we're going to talk about how to structure your Rails application in a way that will allow you to transition to a custom architecture later down the line. Right? We want to move fast. We want Rails to be fast. And we want to be productive. Um, and we want to hit the ground running. So what is this? Anybody? Yeah, Rails. Um, what does this tell us about our domain? Nothing. Perfect. So we're going to try to fix this. We're going to talk through seven topics. Um, the first one being, how do we go about defining the domain and what that process is like? We're going to talk about how communicating the domain is important, especially with a large team. Um, 
in order to survive a large team. Um, and then we're going to talk about relationships, why they're important and why they're not important. And we're going to talk about aggregates, data access, value objects, and domain services. We're going to talk about what all of those things are and how to implement them in a Rails app. So first, we need a domain. So let's pick a domain that we can build a Rails application around. I'm going to pick the iOS App Store. It's something that we're all familiar with. Um, and let's pretend that uh, Apple executives for, named Scott came to me, and, he's, and he wants us to build this App Store for him. So we're going to sit in a conference room together with a whiteboard, and we're going to start brainstorming the ideas of what this App Store is. So he's like, yeah, obviously, we're going to have apps. Developers can create apps. Um, any developer can. And um, they'll, have, they'll be able to submit several versions of an app. So as they make iterations, they create versions. And they can add one to six screenshots. And obviously, there's customers that are going to be purchasing this app. And customers are going to install specific versions. And customers can leave comments on a version of an app. OK, cool. So we kind of did this brain dump with Scott. We just let him get everything out of his head. We don't interrupt him. We just draw it all out. And then we take a step back, and then we start looking at this and refining it. So we're giving him a visual that we can work on. So I start asking about developers. I'm like, well, it's only developers that can create apps. Well, what about companies like game companies? Um, could they create apps as well? It's like, yes, yeah, companies can create apps as well. OK. So I put those two terms down there. Um, because the word developer wasn't enough to capture that concept. And I asked him, is there any difference between a developer and a company as far as it, how they create apps? He says, no, they're pretty much the same. They do the same thing. Um, well, can we think of a better word than developer or company that encapsulates both of those concepts? And I suggest, well, how about seller, right? They're both selling their apps. And he's like, yeah, seller will work. Cool, so we're going to use seller. And then we look at version, and um, when he was talking about this, he was using the word version and release interchangeably, and I just threw down the first word that I heard. But I'm thinking about versions, and they have version numbers, um, and it's kind of awkward to say a version has a version number. It's kind of redundant, so maybe the release is the right word, so I talked through him with that, and he's like, yeah, release is a better word. And I look at comments, I'm like, what else are you going to leave on comments? Are you going to leave ratings, possibly? And he said, yeah, we're going to leave ratings. OK, well, comment's not going to suffice. How about the word review? Um, it can capture both the concept of comments and ratings. Cool. So we've refined our domain, and we went through this exercise of thinking about the language we're using and making sure that it's accurate for the domain that we're trying to build software for. So to talk a little bit about the finer points of communication there that, we just, that we just demonstrated, there's two sides. You have your domain expert, who's supposed to know about how your domain works. And then you have the software expert, who's supposed to know how to build software for a domain. And you go through this iteration of, you go through iterations of brainstorming, drawing diagrams, speaking out assumptions. It's very important to use natural language, speak out, because he's going to brain dump on you. So you have to fill in the gaps with language. And then let him correct you when you're wrong. And then you keep refining the language. The two responsibilities are your domain experts are looking for things that are awkward or not just right for the domain. Um, and then your developer is looking for things that um, they're using two terms to describe the same concept. Because with, when you build software, you can't use two words to describe a concept. So we're defining a ubiquitous language. And Martin, Martin Fowler describes it the best, I think, a common rigorous language between developers and users. Um, and the need for it to be rigorous, since software doesn't cope well with ambiguity. So from your user, to your product owner, to your domain expert, to your tester, to your, develop, to your designer, to your developer, all the way to your code, you want to ensure one consistent language across the board. If you don't do this, what happens is you're going to create a fragmented language all the people in your team are going to start doing translations to each other because they're not using the same language. Things are going to get confusing. Um, more worrisome is that your code is going to start having different fragments of language. And if you can't understand your domain and communicate, how, how are you supposed to build it? So if there's nothing else that you get out of this presentation, 
This is the most important thing. Make sure you have one language across the board. So if you make a change in your user interface, and you're presenting something to your user, and you made a change to terminology, then you need to make sure that everybody else in the team uses that terminology, and you also need to refactor your code to update that terminology. It's the only way to, to make sure that you have control of a complex domain, is to make sure that it's communicated efficiently and everybody understands it properly. So refactoring your code is very important. So we're going to talk about relationships. We're going to go back to our diagram again. And we're going to look at the relationship between an app and a customer. We're looking at the purchase relationship. And I'm going to show you what it looks like in Rails. We have on top, we have the app, Harris from Active Record, and it has many customers through purchases. And below, we have customers. It has many apps through purchases. So we're questioning which one of these are really valid and if one of them isn't. So I'm looking at the customer has apps through purchases. And it makes sense that a customer needs to know what apps they purchase, right? So if they want to re-download it later, they need to get a list of their apps, and they can select something to download. So that relationship sounds legit. Now, what about apps? Do they really need to know about all of the customers that purchased it? And you might for statistics, or I'm sure you could come up with a reason, but this is going to be our MVP, and we want to keep it pretty limited. There's no reason for us to get a listing of all the customers that created an app, or that purchased an app. So we're going to nix that. Cool. And also, we're going to look at install, kind of in a similar fashion. Um, does our server and our domain model need to be able to link a release with the customer and know exactly which releases customers installed? I have that same tone, so I thought it was me for a second. Um, so. One way we can get around keeping this information is that all the releases or all the apps will be installed on a customer's device. So we can easily send a list of all the apps with the versions to the server. And then the server can then look at the apps to figure out which versions have new updates. Um, and then send us back the apps that have updates. So in our domain model, we actually don't need that relationship either. And what about customers and reviews? Do we want customers to be able to view a list of apps that they reviewed and to look at their reviews? Um, I'm not an iOS developer, so I don't know this for sure, but I don't think that iOS has a mechanism for you to look at the reviews. Um, so we don't need that either. So what we did here is we really distilled our domain down to just the relationships we need. And the benefit of that is we decoupled things that didn't need to be coupled, and we've then whatever relationships are left, those are the important ones that actually matter to the domain. So when we're looking at an application and we look at a relationship, we'll know that has a specific purpose. That's there because it needs to be, not just because it can be. All right, let's get into aggregates. And finally, we're going to get into some code. Tell me we're this guy. Um, we're going to submit a new release of an app. And let's just walk through this real quick. There's a big chunk of code here. So we're going to create a new release. It looks like we're passing in a version number. So we're creating a release object. And then we're creating several screenshots. And we're adding those screenshots to the release. And then we're setting the status of the release to submitted. And then finally, we're adding the release to our app. So what's a better way of handling this? Um, this simple answer, and I'm sure you guessed it, is put it into a method. So we're going to put it into a method called submit release, and the method name is going to describe the domain behavior that we're trying to represent. Also, that the method is on the app. The app is in control of the release and the screenshots and all that because it makes sense, right? An app has releases and all those things, so it should be in control of managing the complexities of that. It's also simpler. Notice that we have a string that's a version number. We don't have to worry about creating the release object and passing in the version numbers, we can just use a very short way um, of representing that. So it makes this very easy to look at at a glance if you're looking through code. Um, and it also makes it easy to use. There's only one place that you can submit a release from. It's through this method. So that complexity will always be managed within that method. And now we're starting to see what an aggregate looks like. So in our example, app is our aggregate. And 
Underneath it, it's responsible for managing things like the release, the screenshot, and the review. And everything that you want to do with screenshots, releases, and reviews has to go through the app. So you want to have a method on the app that manipulates those. You never manipulate them manually. And the reason you do this is you're, you're decoupling the small subset of models from the rest of the system. And if you do this over and over again, you have all these small aggregates that then control their own um, complexities, and then you're kind of breaking up your system into smaller components. So if we look at our app, we, st we start seeing that we're building out all these different domain behaviors. We have submit release, approve release, flag for abuse, mark as staff favorite. And it's also explaining to us how our domain works, what's important to our domain. I can now look at this and get an idea of, oh, this is what's important to the domain, and here's all the things I can do. It's awesome. All right, let's talk about the other side of aggregates, data access. We'll look at another example here. So I have an app, and I'm looking for apps. So I have a where clause. It's just standard active record where clause. I'm looking for apps that are less than a week old and have been purchased more than 10,000 times. So great, that's what it does, but why? Um, it's very frustrating when I see code like this, like, yeah, I know what you're doing, but why are you doing it? So I give this a big fat wet. So what's a better way of doing this? It's really simple. Rails gives it to you. You should use it. It's called scopes. A scope gives a name to the query that you have. Now we know that the meaning of this query is new and noteworthy. We want to know what the new and noteworthy apps are in the App Store. Another cool thing is Figleaf. Avdi Grimm created it. And basically, what it can let you do is privatize all those active record methods, like the where clause, so that you can't actually use it outside of the app. So it kind of reminds your, reminds your developers that, hey, you should only be writing scopes that have, you know, you should only be writing queries that are in scopes. Now, obviously, developers will find a way to get around it if you want to. So this is not enforcing anything. It's a reminder, right? This is Ruby. You can do whatever you want. With great power comes great responsibility. So if we look at our app again, we have all the different ways we can access data. So why is the app important to us, and how are they important to us, and what are the different ways they're important? And we also have our behaviors down there to tell us the things that we can do with it. So we're creating one expressive point of entry for our aggregate. And something else to note, aggregate routes are the domain's only point of entry for, for data access. So if you want to get to release information or screenshots or whatever that is, you're always going to go through your app. So you only need data access on your aggregate. And that's pretty cool, and I'll show you why. So if we structure our subfolders in our models folder like this, so you can't actually have a folder and a model with the same name because modules and classes are the same constant and all that business. So I'm using the plural for apps. And then in there, we have our app. And then those are all the other objects that the app is in control of. And if we look at this, now we know where all our aggregates are. Well, that's pretty cool. The first layer of our models directory shows us where all, all our aggregates are. Now we can look at the behaviors. Um, we know what to look at to figure out where we retrieve data. And now we know what to look at when we want to make changes or add a feature. Cool. So the last piece we're going to talk about are value objects. And this is actually the most difficult part to talk about and the most lengthy. Um, so I'm going to try to roll through it pretty quick. So there's two types of domain objects. There are entities and value objects. An entity is a thing. So this is the simplest way to describe it. An entity is a thing, and a value object describes a thing. Let's look at an example. Say we have our entity as a customer object, and our value object is a name object. So if I'm a customer, my name's Mike Abiezzi. OK, so if, you, if my cousin is also a customer, and his name is Mike Abiezzi, we're still two unique different things, right? We have our own life cycles. We create accounts at different times. We can deactivate our account. Just because our attributes are the same um, doesn't mean we are the same. And those are the 
that's what makes an entity. It's unique, independent of its attributes. It has a life cycle. It can change state. It's a complex thing that we're trying to represent. Now, a value object, on the other hand, it just describes a thing. So if I am a customer object, and I have a value object that's name, and it has Mike Abiezzi, and I plop it on me. And if I take that and throw it away, create a new name value object with the name Mike Abiezzi and plop it on me, does it make a difference? No, it doesn't make a difference. And that's what make, makes value objects unique. So because it doesn't make a difference, we can just throw them away and recreate them. And because we could do that, we can make them immutable. Immutable is a really cool thing, and that just means that you can't change it after creation. So the reason immutable is cool is because, let's think about an entity, right? It can change state. You can create an entity, uh, or you can create an entity through a constructor, and it sets up an initial state, has behaviors, those behaviors can change the state. But a value object, it only has one method, it's constructor, and, and that constructor creates the state, and then it's done. So they're very simple in terms of how they're built. They're very easy to think about. Um, the other thing, too, is you're sending a value object through a series of functions. Um, nothing can accidentally change its value. Where an entity, um, if, it, if, if, it's a value ob if it's an object that can change, those functions could change the value, and then you get these weird side effects, um, and, your, and um, value objects essentially can make your code safer. Also, value objects don't reference anything, right? It's just an attribute that you use to describe something else. And the whole point of me bringing this up is because value objects avoid the design complexities of entities. And that's a really good thing. If we have 100 models and we can identify, say, 40% or 30% of them, there should be value objects. Well, then we've identified things that will have simpler creation um, they won't have side effects, so they're less error prone. And they won't be related to anything else because um, they shouldn't be. So we're reducing the complexity of our domain. We don't want to un unnecessarily add complexity to our domain. So what's what in our example of an app aggregate? So all aggregates are entities, so that's an easy one. There's this complex thing that builds things and they can change state. Um, a release also has like a life cycle. You can create it, and then when there's a new release, the old release um, is no longer valid. Um, screenshots, now, to answer this one, we have to think about screenshots. Do they have a life cycle? I mean, through the release, I guess they do. Um, are they important on their own for any reason? Not really. It's just another way to add a description to a release. So those are actually value objects. And then if we look at review, let me do a little time check here. OK, I have about five minutes left, so we're going to have to go through this. So if this is a review on Amazon, you can look at a list of reviews. You can edit them. People can comment on them. That would be an entity in Amazon. But in our app store, we don't want any of that. It's just MVP. We want people to just create a review. And if they want to update the review, then they just create a new one. And behind the scenes, we delete the old one. So we get to treat it as a value object. All right, so what does the value object look like? It's just a plain Ruby object. Uh, it doesn't inherit from anything, especially active record. And it has a constructor taking in the attributes. It exposes the attributes as read-only methods. And it overrides equal equal. And to make Ruby happy for fast comparisons in certain situations, I'll let you look this up. We need to alias EQL. And then we also need to um, define hash. So that's what a value object looks like. Another good thing for value objects are factory methods. So if you think about a string, it has the method upcase. What it does is it takes the original object and it transforms it into a um, capitalized version. So it's a very natural thing for value objects, and those are natural behaviors. So we're going to have one here that's next major version. It news up a new value object and then increments the major version. Cool. So the tricky part that is hard to um, get a focus on, or hard to understand to do, is how do you persist value objects? So we're going to talk about three ways. One is inline on the entity's table. Two is serialize on the entity's table. And three is in its own table. And we'll go through each one of those. So inline on the entity's table. We have a, say we have a release. 
and we're looking at the version number value object. And we have our release table that has three attributes for major, minor, and build. And that's where we want to store those values. But we want our domain model, we want our models to be separate objects. So how do we do that? So it's really simple. Um, you create a writer method called version number. It takes in a version number value object. And then all it does is take the attributes from your value object and assign them to your release attributes. And um, on the way out, reading out a ver the version number, you're going to new up a new version number value object and pass in the attributes from the release. So that's how you expose value objects through a release. Um, another thing you can do is hide the, um, hide the attributes on the release, um, the version major, version minor, and version build, because you know, we want to access versions through our version number methods. So we want to hide those. Um, our Second example, we have screenshots. It's an array. And we want to be able to save those to one column um, called screenshots on the release table. And we're going to do the same thing, except we're going to use a JSON serializer. And we're going to serialize the data into our release attribute and then deserialize it out of our release attribute. This is a very basic example. If you're using an array and you want to be able to pop things on, um, you're going to have to get a little bit fancier, but this works, right? This is, this is the basics of what you need. And third, if you want to store a value object on its own table, we'll look at review as our example. And wah, 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 we have to inherit from Active Record. It kind of sucks, but we're going to try to do the best we can. So there's this really cool method on Active Record, though, called read only bang. And what it does is when you call that method, it kind of locks your model so that if you try to change attributes and save it, it won't let you. It will raise a read-only error. Um, but it's kind of awkward because it still lets you set the attributes. So you can still set the attributes, and then you try to save it, and then you get the error. So we're just going to do a little thing here. We're going to create, we're going to override all the writer attributes. And actually, Active Record is using method missing, but just for simplicity. So we're going to create all the writer attributes, writer methods for the attributes, and then we're going to raise error if anybody tries to use it as a reminder, hey, this is read only. Don't use this. And we're going to wrap that into a method called immutable. And then after we save the record, we're going to make it immutable. So that way, it can't ch you can change it during creation, but once it's saved, you're done. It doesn't change anymore. And also in find, when we retrieve it from the database, it's also going to be immutable, so you can't change it. So it forces you to throw it away and create a new one when you actually need to make a change to a value object. And we're going to, do, we're going to implement equal equals again, same reasons. So last, let's talk about domain services. So we talked about aggregates. Aggregates have their own little world of complexity that they're controlling. What if you need to process a transaction between two aggregates? Well, what do you do? One aggregate isn't allowed to reach out of itself and affect anything else, right? So we need a third party to handle that for us. And that's where domain services come into play. So let's look at an example. Say we want to gift an app. Um, we need to do two things. We need to charge the gifter that's purchasing the app. And then we need to assign access rights of the app to the giftee, right? So customer, our, our customer object is an aggregate. And even though we're just affecting two customer objects, they're still, in the, they're still independent aggregate instances. So they still are not allowed to reach over into each other. So we're going to use the domain service to handle this transaction. So simply, again, the domain service facilitates a transaction between two aggregates. So our, our model looks something like this. We have a customer and has purchases. We need to expand that a little bit more to separate the concept of purchasing and actually being able to use an app. So we're going to introduce another model called access right. And we're going to take a look at, in code, what a domain service looks like. And it's going to be a simple Ruby object. Um, it's, its name describes the behavior that the domain is trying to fulfill. It doesn't inherit from anything. Um, and then it's going to have an ex execute method. So it's just one operation. We're going to take in all the things that we need to make this happen, this transaction happen. So we'll take the app, the gifter, and the giftee. The gifter and the giftee are our customers. 
And we create a purchase record for a gifter, and we create an access right for a gifty. And likely, you'll want to use database transactions and whatnot, but you get the idea of how to structure these. So let's look at our Rails directory again. We can create a services folder that has all these domain services. And now we get to see all of the cross-aggregate trans, trans um, excuse me, all of these cross-aggregate transactions. So in summary, we talked about how to continuously refine the domain with the domain expert. We talked about um, how to insist on having ubiquitous language for seamless communication across your team. We talked about constraining relationships to only the ones that you need. We talked about creating aggregates to manage complexity and express domain behaviors. And we talked about expressing the domain's intent through well-defined data access. And we talked about creating value objects to eliminate unnecessary complexity. And we talked about domains, creating domain services to express transactions between aggregates. So if we look at our Rails directory again, we started out with this. It just tells us it's Rails. And now we have this that actually tells us how our domain works. So over here, we have our aggregates. We know all the entry points of our application. We know where to retrieve data. And we know where to enact domain behaviors. And we also know um, all the services and what, what be domain behaviors are across aggregate transactions. So now we actually have a Rails application that expresses our domain. Thanks for listening. Again, thank you for QuickLeft for sponsoring me. Um, we're hiring, so if anybody's interested in working at QuickLeft, it's a really fun culture, come talk to me. And a special thanks to Paul Rayner at Virtual Genius. Um, he's been kind of a DDD mentor for me. I'm on the internet, and I am also trying to find a few people to mentor. So if anybody's interested in mentorship, it doesn't matter what you want to learn. Um, you could be an ultimate beginner, or you could be advanced. If you're advanced, then maybe you'll be my mentor. And so go on my website and go to the mentorship section if you're interested in that. So now, questions. Yeah, so the question was, can, you, can I expand on how value objects keep us out of trouble? So it's, it's really simple. You're boiling down an object to something that's extremely simple. So it's hard to mess it up, right? If it can change, then you can change a the state. Then you've got to manage a state that changes. And you might have domain rules around, OK, if you have this, then you have to have that. So a value object allows you to put all those in one method, and then you're done. It's just that one method that controls it. And the other thing is, when you pass that value object through functions, um, it can't act, those functions can't accidentally change it. So you won't get these weird side effects. Whereas if you have an object that you can change, it went through 10 functions. And then when it came out at the end, it's different. And you're like, oh, god, why is this different? What happened? Oh, where did it happen? Um, so, and also, it doesn't have relationships. So you're not coupling it to anything. It's a good question. Oh, yeah. The question was, how do you um, translate this for a API? Um, and he mentioned that he feels like it's more of a MVC type of thing. So I think it works perfectly fine as an API, and I've used it several times that way. Um, you're really just, as an API, you're really just getting to the nuts and bolts of how your domain works, and then you make changes in your domain, and you do things, and you just create your domain to represent that. In fact, I think it's actually easier. No? OK, great. Thank you, guys.